The truth is somebody else's labor put me forward. And I tend to think of it as giving forward, not giving back, uh, because I really have just learned that I've never given anything that hasn't paid, you know, paid forward, whether it's for me direct or someone else. And um, I think that's really important. I think, you know, when I I remember once, Chanel, I was about to receive one of my first business awards Mm -hmm. and I called my mom all excited about it. And she said to me in her very Southern, very soprano voice, uh, very soft voice, very loud intent. She's very loud message. She said, Janice, just remember the award is not the reward. Follow the Leader features dynamic women entrepreneurs in their journeys to becoming a success in business. This podcast is an inspirational space for entrepreneurs, future entrepreneurs, and thought leaders as they share their keys to success. I am Chanel Christoph Davis, the CEO and founding partner of the largest woman and minority-owned sales tax advisory practice in the country, Davis Davis and Harmon, LLC. Lovingly known as JBH throughout the business world, Janice Bryant Howroyd is the founder and chief executive of the Act One Group, a global leader providing customized cutting edge solutions in the human resources industry. JBH ranks number 34 in the Forbes list of the wealthiest self-made women. She is celebrating 40 years in business this year, born and raised in Tarboro, North Carolina. Welcome to Follow the Leader, Janice Bryan Howroyd. How are you today? Hey, Chanel, I'm fantastic and you sound great too. Awesome. So I really want to spend some time with you just to, you know, get some pearls of wisdom from a dynamic leader in business. And hopefully, you know, this interview will be inspiration for entrepreneurs around the world. Well, let's make it happen. All right. So you started your business with $900 in 1978. That's 10 years, only 10 years past the end of the civil rights era. You relocated from North Carolina to California to start your own business. What made you want to start your own business? Why not just move to California and look for a job? Well, let's set the foundation of this conversation on a steady ground first. I uh, did not start my business with just my business didn't start with just that point at the nine hundred dollars my business started the day i was born into a family of entrepreneurs i didn't know until much later actually i didn't recognize the value of the entrepreneurial spirit of where i was born you mentioned tarboro north carolina anybody who knows american history knows that at the time i was born i was born into a very segregated pre-civil rights society and a low economy uh, uh community but what was great for me was that 11 kids had one mom and one dad who came from entrepreneurially spirited people. So by the time I came to California on a vacation to visit my sister Sandy and her husband Tommy Noonan, I was already fundamentally ready for entrepreneurship. I just didn't know that. I came out here on a vacation. He, Tommy asked me to stay because he saw the joy that it brought my sister to have a sibling present. And that's, that's how it started. So yeah, the $900 is a part of the story. It's not the beginning of the story. Understood, understood. Now, now why a placement firm? You know, you're very, um, very innovative and so talented. What made you think, you know, I'm gonna start a placement firm as my first business entrepreneurship venture? Actually, again, I have to tell you, everything in my story is so uh, uh, so founded upon faith and, 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 and family uh, before the fortune. I think the thing that happened for me is that when I was looking for work, I really got an experience of what that was like for others. And I didn't find the work I was looking for. We can, att- we can attribute many reasons to that. And that can be gender. It can be race. It could simply be that, you know, I was of a different culture culture than what people were looking for in California coming straight from North Carolina. I wasn't all fancy and global as I am now, right? Yeah, you're fancy uh, now. <laughs> so I didn't know how to brand myself to the, uh, toward the companies that I was interviewing in. But that was a gift in and of itself because what happened is Tommy and what ha- happened was <laughs> is that Tommy and Sandy went away on a business um, conference 
overseas and they extended their stay by a week or so, which gave me uh, several weeks to work in Tommy's office as a temp. When he came back, he didn't recognize the changes that I had made. He just benefited from the outcomes of them and encouraged me in his own way more about staying in California and not returning east than about my entrepreneurial ability. Still, he did suggest to me that I hang my own shingle. He thought I really had a unique way of a, I didn't go in there and say, okay, you're fired to everybody. However, I did make changes uh, to process and to people. And that's what I do today in my company, Act One Group, across the globe. It's about how we're approaching process and people and recognizing total talent communities in the delivery of service we offer our clients. Many of our clients are Fortune 50 companies, and many of our clients are mid-sized companies. All of them are benefiting from our unique ability to uh, approach total talent communities with very solved solutions that can work and that can grow and flex for them. Ergo, the name Agile One. Right. So, you know, I already feel your spirit. I've been in a room with you twice and you definitely have a a very strong um, advocacy and mentoring sort of vibe that you put out. You know, when I have a conversation with you, I feel as though you are imparting wisdom and it comes so naturally from you that it makes so total sense that you would be in the the industry of human resources because you're such a, a, a glowing and wonderful, warm person in person. Well, human resources is a big, uh, it, it's really big nomenclature. And by that, I mean, it's about keeping the human in the human resources. And we're all resources to each other. Yes. That is the foundation of the culture that I'm looking to build. And I believe companies more than ever, you know, we've got some of the greatest clients on earth. Early in the building of my company, I did make a decision that I wanted to be sure I was doing with business with companies that I would be proud to send any member of my family into. And when we gather around my family table, whether it's at a table in one of my homes or my mom's home in North Carolina, we're talking about people who are high level engineers. We're talking about entrepreneurs. We're also talking about day workers and people who do light industrial jobs. And we all have a common theme of family at that table and work is the basis for that. And so for me, it's really important that we keep the humanity in human resources. We understand that as humans, we're resources to each other. And I'm so proud that of the fact that the people, whether you're looking at my C-suite executives or the people who are working at the client spaces or in the branches throughout Apple One offices uh, where we provide staffing, that all of these people understand the common theme of who we are. The applicant is the center of our universe. The worker is the center of our universe. Our technologies are very sophisticated. And we implement artificial, inte- implement artificial intelligence and predictive data analyses in how we work. None of that is of any value if we don't understand that there are people from communities who are cooperating with each other who make it all work for us. And when you think about the fact that we're operating in over 22 languages and over 20 countries yes. with, with where I actually have brick and mortar, that's a big statement. It's also a simple statement. Now, Chanel, we all know simple doesn't mean easy. Oh, no. But if we can, if we can task ourselves and commit to the work invested, then simple can have great outcomes. You just said so much that I would like to unpack there. I mean, that was amazing what you just, you know, shared with us about your business and that you're in so many different countries around the world. You're a global company with brick and mortars, which is not a small feat. That's significant. One of the things that I also picked up. Well, is, that means we're paying to be there. <laughs> Let's oh, be no. clear. No, you're paying to be the boss for sure. So. I know that is not a, that's not a simple task at all. That's, that's complicated. <laughs> um, and you mentioned a couple times in this uh, already your mom, and yes. I've, I've heard you credit your mom, Miss Erletha Wright Bryant, as your mentor. What have been some of the most significant lessons that your mother has taught you in business that you still you're using today? 
Well, let's. Uh, I mean, you don't have time on this on, the, uh, on this visit for me to share podcast? all of that. <laughs> Let me try to give you just a real high level dose of what Miss Elretha Knight Bryant means to my business. First of all, she taught me the value of partnering well. She gave us a dad. There are eleven children in my family. One mom, one dad. My dad loved my mom well. It's so significant to me, and don't let me choke up on this. As we approach Mother's Day, yes. that this tiny little lady who, along with her husband, raised 11 children in the values they wanted to see us grow up in, that have meant more to me in growing my business than anything else I've learned from anywhere. The last day I saw my dad alive, he was hugging my mother and loving her as if they were teenagers in the back of the car. It was kind of embarrassing for me. I've said this before to people. It was kind of embarrassing for me to see it, but it also was very illuminating. It taught me the value of respect respect and loving well. It taught me that gender uh, appreciation. It taught me cooperative, clear communication. It taught me that you should treat everybody as if it could be your last moment because it very well could be. And when I watched how my mom delivered the service she did to the community and to the family, it also taught me that these are very cooperative, that your major enterprise is going to be as strong as the community community you're in, so you should serve them both well. As entrepreneurs, oftentimes we get so busy with our vision for what we want to achieve that sometimes we have people along our ride with us, but we're not a appreciating them for the entrepreneurial value they can give. Mom valued all of us. Do you know I grew up in a household where from the day I could recognize language, we were participating in weekly Thursday uh, afternoon uh, meetings. My family had family meeting on Thursday afternoon. Everybody was busy with church on Sunday. You didn't go to church. You didn't go anywhere else. Um, but we were we would have a family meeting on a Thursday, Chanel, and we cover the business of the family. Wow. And if we mom and dad taught us that if we went to bed angry at night, they they encouraged robust argument amongst the children. But if we went to bed at night, you couldn't be angry with each other. Dad would always tell us, if you're going to bed angry, it's your attitude, not your aptitude, you know. And uh candidly that's very much how I hire today is I hire for attitude. We can teach people and enrich people with the skills we want them to have, but it's the attitude they bring that so evolves the culture and the opportunity for a result to occur. Anybody can build a great strategy, but execution is what really matters in the game and attitude influences execution. You know, that is so key. And, you know, I am 17 years in business, not 40 like you. I'm a baby in this thing. <laughs> but I have learned through this game. Now, wait a minute. Chanel, Chanel, not 40 like me. Come on, girl. Well, you you know. throwing shade. You recognize I'm sitting here talking with you in stilettos. No, I'm not throwing shade. I'm, I'm giving honor. I, I'm, I'm saying you are an icon. I'm here to learn from you. Listen. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. Look, if Tina Turner can walk across the stage in her stilettos, I'm going to give honor too, right? Yes, yes. And I'm, I'm writing notes as you speak. I mean, some of the things that I've written down is attitude, execution, entrepreneur value, and seeing those things in your employees is key. I love that. That's so critical in order to move your vision forward. You can't have a vision if you don't have a people on the ship to help you steer the ship. Yeah, and blessing your people for their ability to bring attitude. And also understanding that as your business grows, sometimes your employees, key valued employees, are going to grow beyond you. And knowing that just because they leave your business, they don't have to leave your 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 your, your consciousness and your appreciation, blessing them forward. Or understanding also that oftentimes you're going to have to provide a lift for people so that they can continue to grow. Being able to very pragmatically ask yourself will what got me here get me there and understand that it's about processes and solutions more often than it is about people Absolutely. you know so uh so so these all play in the opportunity for entrepreneurship is so kaleidoscopic 
topic today. It's richer than it's ever before. No, I'm not a Pollyanna. Chanel, I'm not saying that there aren't the isms that still exist, whether it be sexism, racism, you know, whether it's the state of the economy or the political world. All of those things have been the challenge for people forever. People talk about, oh, well, I can't build my business because of these millennials. Do you know people have been transferring from the age of 18 to 35 for years, so millennial ain't nothing new? It's about how we look at it. And I just really think that when we, when, when we appreciate the opportunity versus despair of the complexity, we're able to really grow forward. And that's a decision. That's, that's a, decision. a decision you really get to make. Yeah. You follow me on that? You with me? Absolutely. That's a personal decision. You have to figure out how to, how to manage in a new environment, in a new culture. And, you know, uh, one thing that we keep hearing about, you know, people put these things into the universe that, you know, we're going to be facing a recession within 18 months. Well, I want to say you've lived through quite a few recessions. Do you have anything you can share? How do you weather the storm when there's a crisis? Or, you know, for me and my business, you know, I look forward and I plan accordingly, but I don't let fear rule me. I don't let feel fear guide me. So how do you, what, do you have a word for people who are listening in business? How do you, you know, steer when there's crisis or storms that comes in your business? Oh, Chanel, you so sweetly gave that answer. You know, uh, uh, don't let fear guide you. So here's the thing. Number one, in my business, on, especially on the on, on the talent side, the recruitment side, one of the things that I have learned over these years is that jobs don't have futures. People do. Now, you've got people like Jeff Bezos and uh, Bill Gates, and these people are out there, 300,000 people working in a building the size of a small community, hiring 300 people a day. There are there are still opportunities for work. Those opportunities are changing. I did some work under a grant from Bloomberg uh, a year or so ago in D.C. And one of the things we were looking at is that pyramid of security that we have in the USA, right? Mm-hmm. Where the bottom of that pyramid is a lot, or that triangle, is a lot wider at the bottom where people have fueled the economy with working with the idea that as you go up in age, there are fewer people to support. But the dynamics of how we work today, especially with the opportunity, or some people would call the fear of uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, yes. is changing that dynamic and people can get as scared about that as they can about economic tides. What I will tell you is that for every job lost, we're creating new jobs. Our duty as citizens of the world and as uh, and as uh, members of one common work community is to make sure that we're re-educating and retraining folks so they don't get caught up in the grind. Rather, they can continue on their grind as, as, as uh, income earners. Now, with respect to the question from an entrepreneurial perspective of how we look at the economy, I would apply that same thought set around jobs don't have futures, people do. I would also say that the economy doesn't dictate your future. Your company dictates the economy. It's how thoughtful, how value-driven, and how uh, clear we are in not just strategy but execution of what we do as business owners and as business members that will impact the economy. uh, Businesses have grown through all economies from the beginning of time. Absolutely. It's how, how they meet that moment. And so I think that's very important for us uh, to understand. And the last thing I'll say on that is that, you know, I've said it publicly. I think I put it in my first book. Um, I have my next book coming out. Uh, I think I put it in my first book, Chanel, and that is no matter who signs your check, you write it. Mm. And that that's about uh again it's tying in that whole thing about how you execute on and and the attitude you bring to it you know you can execute or you can perform an execution and i prefer the first i just think that really the opportunity is never richer for people who truly want to apply in continue to be evergreen in how they are learning and contributing to society and are fearless to your point and are fearless now that doesn't mean that you are thoughtless Mm-hmm. But you have to apply some very disciplined uh, value thinking to how you're building for your careers. And I think the opportunity is there. History is happening so much faster today. So much faster. You know? Yes. 
So, so, so I think if you recognize that and you can be very in stride with who you are and bring your best self to what you're doing, the opportunity is rich for you. That's not me being Pollyanna. That's me sharing with you the truth of my experience. And that's what we want to hear, Miss Janice. So listen, you foreshadowed my next question. I have been in a room with you, and I don't know if you realize this, twice within the last 12 months. Once we were at the CBC conference in D.C., and we, we were in a panel discussion with um, Sean Puffy Combs. And the second time, we were at the Women of Color Summit here in Dallas. And my observation of you are you're a very dynamic person. You command attention. But you are also unapologetically a woman. You are, how important is it for you to be feminine in the boardroom while being the boss that you are? Let's just put it this way. You asked at the front of this in interview the impact my mother had on me. I've never seen such power, such thoughtfulness, such intelligence as I've seen in my mother. And I continue to this day to see. So truly my role model in life has been my mom. You've heard publicly me speak about Madam C.J. Walker, yes. about Mrs. Pankhurst and Elizabeth Cady Stanton as women who I admired for what they have meant to the world, not just to women. I do believe that when we support the fullness of opportunity for women, we support the fullness of opportunity for creation and for the life, you know, for the whole economy. Mm -hmm. So for me, bringing who I am into a space, it's it, it can seem heroic, but it's actually my default to where I'm best comfortable. I'm best comfortable being me. Years ago when I came to California and I saw all these beautiful women with this flow hair and everybody carried the same purses with somebody else's initial on it. I think they were uh, Louis Vuitton purses that people all carry the LVs on. Mm -hmm. And I quickly realized that I didn't fit that formula. Now, I got me some Louis Vuittons. Don't, don't think I'm hate on that. Okay, but uh, when I came to California, I didn't and I didn't look like all the beauties that I saw who I saw. And so my sister did a lot of work with me and she helped me to learn to appreciate who I was and the beauty of what I represented for myself. And uh, I just learned that it was going to be a lot easier for me to be naturally me. Absolutely. I think it's also I think it's also more thoughtful to the to the whole work community and to the to the full community at large when we allow people to be ourselves, you know, and however that genders out, we've got to be really respectful, you know, that people identify who they are themselves and we can't predict that, nor can we predetermine, you know, what we think a person should be. So that's really been a very important thing for me all of my life that, um, that I, I get right with me. The bigger journey I've had, uh, not so much around bringing my femininity to my workplace, is actually forgiving myself for being smart. Mm. I learned early in life that it could be painful to be smart and be a woman, and in my instance, to be a black woman. And so oftentimes, I would gift my intelligence to someone else to promote out of some very, very legacy, latent fears about what would happen to me for being a smart black girl. Interesting. Uh, and I will tell you, it's within the last uh, five years that I have truly forgiven myself for being smart and moving forward. So that's been a bigger and a longer journey for me than actually the journey of being comfortable, being my own feminine self. Well, thanks Does for that sharing that. Answer your no, question? I love that, and that's something that was a, an answer I was not expecting. So thank you for sharing that. That was that was great. I mean, I think that you know, as being you know, smart women, smart girls growing up, we are often you know sometimes we're valued for that and sometimes we they, they want to diminish us for that so i really appreciate that you shared that with us that's really great well, you're so you're so welcome and, and 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 you know i continue today because i keep myself present in so many communities you know chanel you've heard me say if you've heard me speak i'm the most uh magnificently mature millennial you will meet right yes i have that written uh, down right I, here I, I, 
Yeah, and millennial is getting old now, right? We got right. all these next gens and everything. Uh, but here's the thing: I keep myself very present in the uh, in the company of people who are much younger than I am because I learn so much from them. People often uh, want to applaud me for my mentorship of young people, and I tell them mentorship works both ways. And I'm learning as much, if not more, from young people than I can ever give to them. And isn't that the way the world should cooperate? But I see so many of these young women who still bring a lot of that um, that fear about being fully themselves or believing that they have to uh, change who they are to something more commonly accepted. And I just really pray that I can stay young enough, long enough to see that change. And by the way, that's not unique to the USA. I think that is happening around the world. And with the advantage of technology and our ability to see practices, I think we have an inherent responsibility to change those practices that don't promote us as our best at being human. Yes, and I think another thing about you being a mentor, you also, you're very giving. You've given back to your local community in North Carolina A&T. You give a lot in California. I think that that also is something to be admired in a practice that, you know, really um, others can learn from. When I went to A&T the first year I attended and I remember getting a scholarship, it was from uh, it was from a legacy of a white woman who had died in our community who felt that she wanted to leave money to ensure that women got educated. She did not stipulate race on it, and so I was able to benefit from that, whether by her intention or whether accidentally from a different intention. The truth is somebody else's labor put me forward, and I tend to think of it as giving forward, not giving back. Uh, because I really have just learned that I've never given anything that hasn't paid, you know, paid forward, whether it's for me direct or someone else. And um, I think that's really important. I think, you know, when I, I remember once, Chanel, I was about to receive one of my first business awards. Mm -hmm. And I called my mom all excited about it. And she said to me in her very southern, very soprano voice, a uh, very soft voice, very loud intent. She's very loud message. She said, Janice, just remember the award is not the reward. Mm. And I've lived with that. I've lived with that. That's what my mom told me. Absolutely. Well, I have one final question for you, Janice. How do you define a leader? For me, leadership is about understanding the goals that you have collectively clearly shared and ensuring that they're reached with everybody's ability to win from it. I think that's good leadership, that's solid leadership. And I think leadership in that manner leads to success, which I define as the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Wow. Thank you, Janice, so much for your time. Thank you for sharing these jewels. If my audience wants to follow you, how do we you know, follow you and see what you're doing and, and just keep up with all your amazing projects? Jay Bryant Howroyd, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, tweeting out there, Jay Bryant Howroyd. All right. Well, Janice, thank you again. This has been amazing. I appreciate all the, the pearls of wisdom that you've left with us today. I've taken copious amounts of notes that I'm going to take forward with me. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Chanel. Stay well, stay blessed. You too. Bye-bye. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a comment on iTunes or Google Play or any other podcast platform. You're listening to RMCN, the digital destination for premium talk radio.